Hello, everyone, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. You can also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So, uh, so today we have Cal Molinick coming in from Richmond, Virginia. He's a volunteerist, anarcho-capitalist, uh, co-founder of Liberate, Liberate RVA. He's, uh, he goes on to the campuses in, uh, I think it's the University of Richmond, right? Is that the uh, one? Virginia Commonwealth University. Awesome. So he goes there and he uh, sets up a sign, asks me why government is immoral, right? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and they try to challenge him. Awesome. <laughs> he does a great job spreading spreading freedom and uh and truth so so we're gonna ask him about that and um and perhaps you know using uh using politics uh as some people have tried to do infiltrating the liber- libertarian party and trying to get into government and spreading the message that way um i think that's not that's on everyone's mind right now <laughs> so right. maybe we'll get into that so uh so cal thanks a lot for coming on no, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, glad to be part of your show, part of the uh, the process here of uh, spreading the message. It's uh, it's you've been doing this now for quite some time. I remember when you first launched, uh, and you've amassed quite a good, uh, I guess, a gathering of uh, interviewees uh, on there. So that's that's pretty cool. I'm glad to be a uh, part of your show. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. I uh, I'm trying to trying to get as many voices that are not. Um you know, not heard like like there's so many big name anarchists that you know you hear all the time, right? Like you know Walter Block and Jeff Berwick and Stefan Molyneux. But then there's so many other people that you know have a lot to say and have been contributing a lot, but don't necessarily have the voice. So I try to get those people, you know, the more obscure people, and I enjoy that. <laughs> you know, right. uh, so so yeah. So Cal, um, well, can you tell us? I guess start start us off with, you know, how you became a voluntarist. Uh, you know, what got you down this path? And uh, and then get into what you're doing with the Liberate RVA and uh, and talk to the people in the universities. Uh, I guess you could say hating cops uh, was the first path of uh, my hate for authority. Um, my first experience here in the United States was with uh, with cops uh, that it would be considered kidnapping. You know, if a parent takes a child. Um, out of custody, you know, during divorce. And so that was my first experience, uh, just cops just tearing my mother away from me and, you know, trying to scare the crap out of me and my brother, David. Um, and then after that, just, I don't know, just my, my first introduction to the state was that, um, I guess you could say first introduction to the state would be uh, violent parenting, just a lot of violent people in my life. So it's a natural distrust for people of authority uh, people with titles, and from there, I just kind of grew up naturally uh, being very anti-authoritative. Uh, not in the sense like being anti-dentists, uh, right? You know, they have an authority, you know, in terms of you know the medicine that they practice, but at least I can back that up. Arbitrary authority, I guess you could say, meaningless titles, uh, ones in which uh, you should earn, right? Someone who goes to dentistry, you know, gradually earns those titles. Ones who says they're your parents, you know, because, you know, you have the same blood as you, you know, they're your father. It's like, that's not earned. You know, I also have DNA relations with the banana, <laughs> uh, with uh, animals, right, with monkeys. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're granted these title titles uh, automatically. Uh, so I've always uh, come from that, I guess, not having a family, just realizing that uh, I make my own family and uh, just kind of creating my own little uh, world outside of uh, – the authoritative, violent authoritative one that I grew up with. Um, and so my interest uh, with anarchism arose back in uh, 2006. I say, well, uh, checking out info shops. Uh, info shops are where you'll find a lot of anarcho communist literature, anarcho syndicalist literature, anarcho primitive literature. Nothing about anarcho capitalism, I wish, because <laughs> then I would have been able to start this path uh, a lot sooner. Uh, but of course, everything that they put out, I enjoyed. What, what separated me from, from them, I would say, was um, my love for capitalism, uh, my love for the uh, individual. And so even though there was a lot of uh, areas in which uh, overlapped, I guess, with my hatred towards uh, authoritative figures like the cops in the state, uh, there was areas in which I had to separate myself from, from my, I guess, appreciation of capitalism and uh, ind- individualism. Uh, so I guess you could say sort of as a narco individualist, uh, and then maybe a libertarian anarchist. But that's just me within my own little bubble. I've never met 
anyone else had ever called you. Facebook wasn't around back then. I mean, there was some MySpace, uh, but there wasn't no one. I've never met anyone else who called themselves. So I felt like I was the only anarcho libertarian like for years. And until I moved here to Richmond and meeting more anarcho communists and more anarcho socialists, and then just uh, just calling it quits with hanging out with them and eventually just. Like I'm just gonna have to start my my own branch, <laughs> uh, a more community that doesn't shame and guilt each other into um, being part of that community or part of that group. Uh, more that's that's it is consistent uh, with the values that they preach. Uh, I found those groups had inconsistencies uh, abound and in their ethics and their um, and their viewpoints. And so uh, I guess it was dissatisfaction with a lot of political organizations. Uh, Occupy eventually that led me to say, well, eventually there's nothing out there that I'm looking for. I might have to start uh, my own thing. Uh, I might start have to start uh, with my own friends and launch something that is consistent. And so we just launched we launched uh, Liberate RBA, uh, which is uh, an anarchist organization. At the time, I still didn't have ne never heard of anarcho capitalism or voluntarism or agris. For us, it was just just a strictly anarchist organization that is consistent with being anti political, uh, with uh, with our aims of finding a uh, good measure of success. And it wasn't until that was launched, and a couple months later, then on two. Uh, anarcho capitalism. Uh, I guess the term is a lot more consistent with anarcho uh, libertarian, which can be, of course, confused with the political party. And so, you know, that's not, I guess, a marketing viewpoint. It's not uh, something that sells, I would say, because then they'll think that you're trying to trick them into switching to a political side or to another political cult, um, which is, you know, hard enough to tell someone who's a big fan of, it's like sports, right? You know, you can't get someone who's for risk against to be, you know, to join the Ravens. Um, and so vice versa with Republicanism and Democrats, uh, it's very difficult. So I would say that's that was my start. Um, Big hatred for cops and uh, miscellaneous authority that, you know, uh, and uh, meeting all the folks with that kind of similar alignment brought me to anarchism. Um, and then moving here to Richmond, I guess my own, my own problem was, uh, I guess, how to, how to get there, right? You know, the, the ideas are sound, the philosophy is consistent, and, but I guess I came through a very Hobbesian viewpoint because uh, of a lot of, uh, I don't know, running, I guess, meeting a lot of uh, violent people in my life. And so that, of course, will make you view that the road it itself is violent, that everyone else is has that evil. But moving to Richmond and finally meeting friends, uh, plural, plurality of friends, and every once in a while I'll have singular friends, you know, view, uh, during points of my life. Um, but moving here to Richmond, I've never met, uh, never had that many friends, and I met people who were who weren't out to try to hurt me or trick me or lie to me or steal from me, and it was that, uh, I guess, embracement um, that made me feel like you know what, people can be good. Um, you know, maybe I've been misled and tricked into believing otherwise. Um, and of course, that's kind of what government tries to teach you, you know, uh, that your next door neighbor could be a secret bin Laden supporter or it could be ISIS over there and turn you to one another. And that's that's culture hegemony. Right. So I would say moving to Richmond, uh, it's what brought me to anarchy, uh, meeting nice, good, genuine, moral people, uh, meeting friends. Uh, it's what brought me to anarchy, ultimately. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um I mean, uh, you know, talking about anarcho-communists, you know, they're an interesting bunch of people. They have, uh, it seems like they're more associated with emotional appeals to uh, <laughs> to argument rather than logical, <laughs> you know, right. rather, logic and reason. And um, it's like, uh, you know, trying to make you feel guilty. Don't you feel guilty for that person who has little, <laughs> you know, the poor person or the, you know, do you, don't you think you have too much thing, you know, the, how many things do you actually need, <laughs> you know? Right. And, uh, it's kind of unfortunate. It's like, I think, I think I saw on, uh, on the Liberty RVA, there was a, a meme. It's like, it's like $15 minimum wage because I don't understand economics. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and that's and that's the group that uh, I used to hang out with. Um, I mean, not to say that you couldn't have conversations. I've had conversations, uh, but you know, their means of achieving the state are very inconsistent with what they uh, profess. 
Uh, you know, they they say they're against political rulers, yet there are some that have no problem running for for mayor, for example. There are some that have no problem using political uh, politics to achieve those ends, uh, the same ends that every status advocates for, um, regardless of their intent, right? You know, the road to hell has been paved with good intentions, as they say, uh, and that's where we are today because of that. And, yeah, it's, uh, I found that it's not... I guess the information that they provide is just mostly based on uh, emotional appeals, um, not so much on uh, logical consistencies and uh, reasoning or defining their terms. Uh, that's also been a big, big one. Uh, <laughs> defining their terms is uh, something that they refuse to define. Uh, it has to be very vague so that way they can encompass everything from when you meet uh, someone who's a Republican or Democrat, you know, they themselves find it difficult to define their terms or to separate abstract and concrete concepts. So it just seems, uh, I don't know, it's, it's uh, not that much different than any other political organization I found. Just a lot more inconsistencies. Yeah. Um, can, you, can, can you, oh, sorry, sorry, I just, wanna, I just wanted you to talk about your um, experience talking to the university students um, and... Uh, you know, if you feel like that you've been able to reach more people that way, like you've been successful with that, or is, or is it difficult? Because a lot of people, you know, it's easy to write books and it's easy to, you know, to, I guess, write articles and make videos. But when you're talking to people face to face, like there's there's a certain type of dynamic that's so absent, you know, when you make a video, when you make, when you write an article. So so can you talk about, about your experience with that? Yeah, uh, yeah I, w I would say the best way, the most efficient way to spread these ideas uh, is to have the, that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, non, I mean, communication, most of it is non-verbal, right? Uh, the gestures, uh, the way we present ourselves, uh, walking outside, you're, you're communicating, and all that is missing in an article, all that is missing. Uh, in a video, <laughs> you know, it's you know, you're, you're speaking to a camera, speaking to a screen, uh, and all that, all those areas are just as important, and they're missing, I guess, from the equation how to spread these ideas. And I figure, you know, those people in the past that advocated for politics uh, probably figure it's too difficult to convey these ideas to other people to have these conversations, which is why invariably they end up advocating for politics, because in politics you don't have to talk to anyone. In politics you just hide in a confession booth, um, you know, and you pull that lever and punch that chat. And so it's and no wonder it hasn't gone anywhere, right? No wonder in the end maybe uh, Mary Rothbard gave up on uh, thinking that people could get it and he ventured off towards a uh, political land. And, you know, that's uh, what I found. So. What I found in uh, having one-on-one -on -one conversations is the most efficient way to spread these ideas, murder against rape, against assault, that once we have these conversations that we have a lot in common, that we both share this more integrity against the initiation of force, uh, which is something that you can't really find uh, in, in a piece of paper or in a video itself. And so um, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations, I've, I found it very efficient, very easy to have, um, I don't know, to, to have fruitful conversations to tap to the point in which uh, the person I'm talking to, my new friend, uh, gets it. It's like, you know, this this is logical, this is consistent. Uh, I've met many on, on day one having these conversations like, you know what, all right, this is cool, so I'm an anarchist. All right, got it. <laughs> um, I have uh, my friend Herzone who's a uh, housemate here uh, who, who got it on day one. He's an engineer and so it's like logically it's consistent, got it. And so, I, you know, I find that to be a faster measure of success versus trying to go to the political route. You know, people try to go through politics and I've only met one person, doing this three years, I've only met one person that has come to anarcho-capitalism um, by crediting Ron Paul. And that's it. I've talked to, I have over uh, 200 recorded interviews, uh, probably close to 300. Over 90%, I'll say close to 95%, agree with the argument against the state. At least we can start off with the agreement that the state, the government is immoral, an agreement that taxation is moral, an agreement that the only way that the government knows how to solve problems is through the initiation of force, is by caging peaceful people. And I found that to be a faster um, measure of success and reaching out to new people about uh, anarchism and uh, regardless of their background. You know, uh, mostly the uh, measure of success works is great with, I guess, the market that we target is uh, uh, Republicans, Democrats, socialists. <laughs> uh, so I would say a majority of the people here and who are part of uh, Liberty RBA come from socialist backgrounds. Um, 
And so I, I find that to be a lot faster <laughs> and getting to where we want to go and having these one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, versus the universities where, you know, the uh, academia of soci socialism is uh, spread through, right? I mean, you have your first 12 years uh, to, you know, that kind of strips you and enslaves you on the culture hegemony, but then you have the academia, uh, the intel intelligent class, these are your future bosses, your managers, these are the people who are going, who are, you know, going to make a lot of the um, rules for the community around you, who are going to dictate your future political rulers. And so this is uh, the next level up and, you know, for priesthood, I guess you can say, um, that they teach. And so uh, right there at the very center of where uh, socialism is uh, deeply ingrained is where I find the best place to start to have these conversations. I mean, you can have these conversations anywhere, but at least you know, looking at efficiency, looking at a measure of success, uh, the people I talk to there, uh, the students, at least have time to verify the information, at least have time to check and verify uh, the facts and evidence that's presented uh, versus, you know, going to uh, a busy intersection where people, you know, don't have much time on their hands except, you know, for lunch breaks and going back to work and they have to drive back home through a rush hour, have to cook their meals, have to, you know, do a lot of uh, parenting roles. And so, and when do they have a moment to examine uh, the facts or evidence? I mean, I'm not saying all of them are like that, but you know, I guess looking at uh, efficiency, I find uh, this is another adult population that I find it easier to convey these ideas. And uh, the measure of success has uh, been, been shown, I guess, right now here in Richmond. Uh, off the top of my head, I could probably list up to 60, 75 ANCAPs here. Uh, we probably have over 100 already. I have to redo like every summer, we do a measure of success and I just kind of count down. So, uh, concentration of uh, ANCAPs, uh, largest amount here in Richmond you'll ever find any, than any other geographic region uh, in the world. And I find that to be our greatest measure of success, that reaching out to one another, using a real voice, exercising our voice. Empathy is difficult to find in a video <laughs> or uh, in a book. And so one-on-one -on -one conversations, yeah, I find it to be. Otherwise, uh, if <laughs> that wasn't the case, if all I got, again, was, just, you know, fuck you, Cal, this, you know, that was always <laughs> repeatedly the responses. Uh, I put all the videos out there. Every every single one I do, it's, it's out there on YouTube. So there's some I think I kind of, you know, uh, look at it, it's like well that wasn't successful but a majority of all, all the videos I ever do and record of the interviews are on YouTube and you can see how successful uh, those conversations go um, and those conversations wouldn't have been um, been uh, wouldn't have been able to reach un without talking to my <laughs> friends here in Richmond first before venturing out to talk to um, my neighbors uh, like with um, like some of the other uh, founders of Liberty RBA just uh, just having these, just going back and forth with these questions like for, for months and trying to figure out another way how to uh, present uh, the idea of anarchism uh, that could be easy to be understood. Uh, so I have very much uh, great appreciation for the strong uh, bonds of friendship that I've made here that uh, we're patient enough to go through and eventually, you know what, all right, that makes sense now. And then, you know, finally I figure out a good formula and then um, it's kind of like, uh, again, if you go, if you enter like any games has instruction and rules that the players have to agree to first and then they agree to the consequences and then they can play like in boxing right like it's agree that there's nothing no punching below the waist no ear biting mike tyson and then we can box right <laughs> and, that, and that's explicit consent right uh into the consequences and it's the same thing with having these conversations you need to define your terms uh that's very important you, i find if i don't set it up i mean there are ways to to go and have these conversations in any which way, manner, uh, and still be successful. But I find that the most efficient way to do it is to set up the conversation uh, with the ask me how government is immoral, um, or just uh, ask them those first three questions uh, that I put out there. Um, and, and, to, and finding out that we share these moral positions, uh, violence will be defined as placing a person in an involuntary position without their consent or choice. And those three questions are consistent. They're the same question, but at least it's three ways to phrase it in a way. It's like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? And then once we come to this agreement, then I can paint the brush of what is government, uh, show them that it's nothing but a monopoly on the services that you and I want in which we have no economic freedom to cancel or unsubscribe, nor do we have the economic freedom to compete entrepreneurially. Uh, and USPS is always uh, the first example I use because it's one that most people go to. I mean, you have ABC, but uh, USPS is not one that most people give much thought and consideration. 
and to realizing that, yeah, that is a violent monopoly. Uh, it's illegal and criminal for FedEx, UPS, and DHL to deliver pieces of paper. They can only deliver packages. Uh, and you can even find on their own website on USPS, and when you check the about, they, they even call it a monopoly <laughs> uh, and, you know, in, in, in their own terms. Um, so, yeah, I, I find uh, having one-on-one -on -one conversation, exercising a real voice, right? Voting is trying to tell you that voting is a piece of paper is your voice, a chat is your voice, a lever behind a curtain is your voice. It's not your voice. It's uh, another way knowing that using your voice, that your voice is very powerful and it's the best weapon that we have against the state. And, of course, obviously, the state, knowing that, would want to redivert that attention towards uh, the confession booth instead, in which you don't speak to anyone, in which, of course, you create this dialogue in which if you were to dare to talk about politics, you know, people say, you know, that's a personal opinion. You know, how, you know we don't talk about politics. We don't talk about those issues. Um, and the great thing about anarchy is that it's not a political position to begin with, right? So I could say, yeah, neither do I. <laughs> I'm not here to talk about politics. Uh, mm -hmm. Politics is the language of slaves. Politics is the language of um, telling people what they can and cannot do with their own body. How much do we steal from this person? or that group of people, uh, what should we restrict, you know, through legislation and laws? That's politics. Um, and anarchy is only about the truth, about the fact. But that's about it. Uh, generally, everyone else agrees when we when I have this, these conversations. And I'll say up to now, after three years, I've, uh, you know, putting it all together, I've probably spoken to at least a thousand people. Uh, and that's what I've come. Uh, and I've have recorded empirical evidence to show a fast faster way and most efficient way to have these conversations uh, and I have them myself like uh, practically every day um, and so like I, like I have my own little side business so you know I speak to my clients and I just always have these conversations with them uh, so I would say on on average that's uh, I probably speak to at least uh, five to maybe seven new people every week and uh, just having these conversations, and that's and that's the way it has to be. That's the way it's it's we're only going to get out of here. It's not uh, delaying the future for every four years, spending a couple of hours looking for parking, waiting in line, and then hiding in a confession booth. You know, that's that prolongs the misery, that prolongs the violence, that prolongs the distraction. And those that advocate for politics do the same, at prolonging uh, the delay of the conversation that's really needed and uh, misleading other people into believing that politics would set you free, uh, despite that there is exist no factual evidence to show that politics or voting has ever done that for anyone. Yeah, yeah, and, and what I, I particularly love about what you guys are doing is, is uh, you know, the, 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 you're formulating the, the knowledge that, you know, most anarchists and volunteers understand into a way that's easily transmissible to people who have never been exposed to this, right? Because that's the most important thing, to communicate this stuff to other people. Like, if it's just with us, what good is it going to do, right? Right. <laughs> because if it's just with us, then we're going to exist alongside government. And we don't want that. We want more as, as many people as possible to understand this so that they're, um, you know, opting out and choosing alternative uh, pathways of, uh, of living, you know, is what's going to topple government. It's just opting out, <laughs> right? So that's what I really uh, applaud with you guys. And I hope, uh, you know, I, I hope it would uh, continue and, and, you know, you that you would educate people and show people, you know, how easy it is to talk to people and how, you know, when you, when you hone this information, you know, it can be easily understood. I'm still working on that myself, so <laughs> I applaud you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we have uh, there's other chapters now outside of Liberate RVA. The new ones have come out. There's a Liberate Baltimore now. There's a uh, Liberate uh, Orange County. Uh, I have a friend who looks like he's getting ready to start a Liberate Arkansas. Wait, Orange and, Orange County in New York? Uh, California. Oh shoot! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and, and they're just as excited uh, to do this as well. Um, and I'll be going to try out in the next. Uh, couple of years to start visiting out a lot of these other uh, chapters and uh, um, helping, you know, the efficiency of, uh, I guess, th their movements uh, start fast, fast too as well. Like I'll be heading up to uh, Baltimore probably this month or next month to do uh, Spreading Anarchy there. We did one in D.C. Uh, with some of my Maryland friends and 
you know, that's so they're they're getting ready. They're they're practicing, uh, and that's kind of how we kind of have to proceed. That's that's the way we fight the matrix. Um, it's not uh, yelling at buildings. Uh, yelling at the Fed is not going to make it disappear. Uh, <laughs> <Apply> posters. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Uh, you know, pulling levers is not going to make the state disappear. And you know, it's the idea that the war that the state started, you know, it exists here in our heads, uh, in our minds. Uh, that's where the war is, the war on philosophy, the war on words, uh, the war on truth. And so knowing that that's kind of where it exists, that's where cultural hegemony gains control uh, and enslaves the youth and, and everyone and those you love, that's kind of how where we need to approach it. Um, politics doesn't do anything in um, you know, reaching out towards the, those particular areas. It misleads you and distracts you again into believing that politics is still the way, government is still the way. Uh, uh, civil disobedience, for example, is another form of uh, obedience and, and the fact that you're still acknowledging there's still someone to obey, right? You know, if, uh, if my father was someone that was not kind and trying to have these conversations for him to understand um, peaceful parenting and still refuses and, uh, you know, and at some point you, you let that relationship go, because uh, it's still trying to be toxic and abusive, you don't, uh, you're not acting in civil disobedience anymore, right? You just cut off that relationship. That's still sort of ostracism. Um, that's not civil disobedience, because it is, and you're, you're saying that your father still has uh, that control and power over you, some kind of authority. <laughs> uh, and civil disobedience does just that, acknowledges that the government has, is their parental figure, has that kind of role and authority over you. Uh, protesting does the same effect. It, uh, it's another way, the meaning behind protesting is to compromise, uh, to find deals, to uh, find uh, ways in which we can uh, compromise with government and return for some few freedoms in return. And of course, and that's so much the government says, you know, we don't compromise with terrorism. Well, yeah, let's <laughs> at least universalize that to include also government, right? I don't want just some of my freedoms. I don't want just scraps of my freedoms. I want all of it returned, everything that was mine rightfully by birth. And protesting, again, is another uh, failed form of uh, activism. Uh, you know, the largest groups of people who've tried that, you know, was during uh, Woodstock, uh, hippie uh, revolution, you know, you had millions of people all over the country doing that, those same kind of forms of uh, activism and had not achieved anything. Um, you know, living your life shouldn't be an act of civil disobedience. It should, should just be living your life. Uh, and, and the performance, even though it goes against the state. Um, I do that every day. Every day. Uh, I know there, they, there's a book out there that says technically everyone uh, commits three felonies a day, you know, so to speak. Uh, yeah. I break probably at least uh, 10, 15, 20 <laughs> laws every day. <laughs> uh, Proudly. So, so there's two forms of uh, statism that you're fighting. It's not just uh, the externality, you know, of the abstract concepts. Um, it's also the concrete ones, the, the internality one, the one of uh, the ones that hold you back from, uh, from speaking out, uh, from saying the truth, from uh, having the, that prevents you from having the courage uh, to go against the grain, to go against uh, what's unpopular. Um, and so, you know, being anti Government sometimes can be popular, but being consistent uh, tends sometimes to not be popular. Um, so that's uh, what I find to be the best way to do it, just to be very vocal, just to live your life, uh, to be anarchy, right? Anarchy is a, it's a way of life. It's a way to continue to grow, continue to uh, educate yourself. It doesn't stop once you understand the argument against the state. You know, there's, it, it's another way to realize your whole life has always been uh, implanted in that matrix and to keep unplugging a lot of the uh, misinformation and the uh, bad habits, uh, bad rituals that have been ingrained in you. Um, you know, it's, it's something that uh, never ends. And so areas in which uh, people realize that they become anarchists and sometimes maybe in the position that they work for the state, you know, it's not about quitting your job either or stop paying taxes altogether. It's taking the steps first to uh, to find a way to achieve those ends, maybe find a way to eventually work in the private market, you know, to unplug yourself maybe a year or two. But the more and more community friends that you, that you make, you know, that transition will be easier. Uh, eventually, you can get to the transition into not paying taxes here and there. And, uh, and ultimately, that's, that's our goal here with Liberty RVA, um, eventually to reach 10,000 people and then 10,000 anarchists altogether 
we can push the next phase, uh, I guess, launch social ostracism day and stop paying taxes altogether, stop charging sales taxes, and start ostracizing uh, the people who do commit the real violence in our community. And those are your police extortionists, your political rulers, uh, I guess your uh, IRS. You know, it's kind of like in the same way the biker and uh, and, and that uh, Waco incident uh, recently with all those gangs being uh, arrested, kidnapped by those cops. Uh, you know, there's a tattoo artist that says that people with the uh, patch insignia of uh, the police are not welcome in this establishment. Um, and <laughs> that's beautiful. Uh, and I envision uh, Richmond to eventually do the same thing. Those who uh, seek to violate consent, to be against consensual relationships are, are not welcome. Right, and that's so much. No one would want to associate the, associate themselves with uh, would be rapists, murderers, and thieves. Um, that's the best form of self defense we can have against uh, those kinds of people. Where are you going to go? Right, if you're a police extortionist, and you know your friends or family are starting to to see the truth. Where are you going to go? Right. Hopefully, at some point, that at some point, that'd be enough pressure for them to realize uh, the ghastly mistakes they've made in aligning themselves with the state and maybe making amends and. Uh, restitution to those that they've hurt. Uh, they'll turn in their badges, burn their uh, police extortionist uniform, and be a part of this peaceful society. Um, and you know, there's there's still always a way to be a part of that. But it's um, by continuing to hold those values, those status values, against community bonding, against uh, you know, uh, wanting to hurt peaceful people. You know, those are those are never welcomed. Uh, you know, civilization belongs to the civilized, and those actions and what they represent obviously do not. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and it and it takes uh, a, a lot of effort on our part to to help them realize that you know what they're actually doing is not, you know, is not promoting order or protecting people or saving or you know safety or anything like that. <laughs> you know, all they're doing is enforcing the arbitrary mandates and edicts from our political masters, and which most of the time are, you know, for victimless crimes and just punish peaceful people. Um, and uh, to get them to understand that requires, uh, you know, intellectual, great intellectual feat <laughs> that of, uh, you know, deprogramming what they have learned ever since before they could talk, right? Most of us, uh, most of us have uh, been so ingrained with the statist mentality um, that it really takes a Herculean efforts to overcome um, but that's what we're facing and that's what we have to do, you know, that's our, that's yeah. our, that's our, uh, hurdle, right? <laughs> that's the, the task set before us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that's why, you know, it's so important, you know, talk to especially people in law enforcement and in the military, you know, it's so, so important, but that's like, that's like the, the place where people are like, don't touch, don't mention, you know, you can, you can criticize healthcare, you can criticize, uh, you know, I don't know, taxation or something, but don't don't criticize the police or the military, okay? They're putting their lives on the line <laughs> right. for our freedom, right? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, and, and I find it best to always remind them that uh, those government courts have even decreed that the police have no obligation to protect your life, liberty, or property. Um, you know, if that, was, if that was the case that they're putting the line to do that, um, then why did their own judges, why does their own law state differently, All right? Um, and then you realize that you have no security, that you're being forced to pay for the presumption of security, for the lying claim that they're here to protect your life, liberty, property when uh, factual evidence has shown otherwise. Um, and But that's like in Winnebago versus DeShaney County, and that's something that most people have never heard of. And I always find that one example to be a very useful one to kind of help them understand, I guess, in, in um, terms of security that you have today. You don't, you don't have security. Uh, <laughs> is it security when someone throws someone into, of course, a cage for, for a plant? Uh, there was a guy here in Richmond uh, who was staying at a motel, went out to go get himself uh, some oatmeal sitting in his car. The police come knocking on his door. Uh, trying to get his papers, trying to ask for his papers, you know, threatening to, to kidnap me, him, of course. Uh, the guy just didn't respond, you know, for a little while and just sat in his car and recorded the whole incident. Actually, you have two million of them suffering in rape cages today. It's like, you know, it's, you, you call that, how is that not chaos, right? Um, you know, in terms of when sometimes they say, well, anarchy is chaotic. It's like, well, let's examine uh, the situation that we have today and tell me, uh, <laughs> tell me when to stop, 
when I <laughs> when when you realize that that's chaotic in itself, right? You're most more likely to be murdered by a cop 80, 86 times more likely to be murdered by a cop than a terrorist. Uh, but of course, uh, police extortions themselves is the terrorist. Um, now I had this uh, conversation with Panzer just a little bit, and you know, it's the individual has can can leave the vocation, of course, can leave the title um, and the badge, and can redeem themselves, sure. But the vocation that that is the title of a police extortionist uh, is something that's to vilify. You can't really take back and say, well, maybe uh, we can, you know, because I don't know if anyone's ever said, you know, the Gestapo are good people too, right? You know, they're just, uh, you know, they're, they're just uh, misinformed. They have, they, have, they have families to feed. They, they, they gotta have families their, to they, feed. They got to educate their kids. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, no, no, no one ever says that, uh, you know, but the same kind of attitude needs to be shared. Uh, with viewing what police extortionists do. They hurt peaceful people. Uh, that's their job. That's, vo that's their vocation. Uh, first, of course, they need to rob your property in order to make the line claim that they're there to protect it. Right? And when you have a lot of civil action forfeiture cases all across the United Tax Forms of America showing that millions and millions of dollars are stolen from peaceful people all the time, uh, you know, there's factual evidence to show that, you know, that's the very same people. These are your war wars. I mean, they say that, you know, what if war wars were to take over? They already taken over. <laughs> They're already here. Um, and it's funny because Canada uh, trying to warn their own tax slaves that be careful when you enter the U.S. because their police extortionists will try to steal your money. Um, and, all, and, of course, the presumption is on you to prove to their government courts that it has nothing to do with uh, illicit drugs or anything like that. So $100 uh, to lawyer up. Uh, and they know that most people won't take that trip back to those courts. So you know they bank on that and they make millions of uh, robbing people, You know these road pirates, as uh, Lysander Spooner will call it. Um, and I guess that's, that's why I focus first on USPS. It's a great example to show an example of what a government monopoly is and then extrapolating that information that's how all government monopolies work um, you know when you have a, mon a government monopoly costs go up quality goes down uh, with the USPS there are 16 billion dollars in debt every year they borrow uh, like low interest uh, federal loans up to three billion dollars now uh, you know they, they make the claim that they're private but you're not private when you're stealing uh, loans that are uh, you know extortion funded mm -hmm. right uh, their solution in resolving long wait lines is removing the clocks so you don't know how long you've been waiting uh, there's a lot of stories of post uh, postal workers just throwing the mail out because it's uh, inconvenience don't have enough time to carry it out throwing cut of Saturdays uh, and that's and of course, uh, that's my favorite one to attack, uh, not just because Lysander Spooner attacked that one too, uh, but I guess maybe it is. Maybe it's, uh, you know, that's the first one he vilified, and, you know, it's uh, one that should go down as well, especially. Um, especially when they have the selective service there, uh, propaganda, uh, telling you that your children will be threatened with uh, kidnapping, you know, if they don't sign up at the age of 18, threatening your sons, that if they don't sign up to be slaughtered, um, you know, they can face uh, several years in a cage or up to, I believe, like $250,000 extortion fee. Which, of course, if you don't pay, you're thrown right back into a cage. Um, so that's, uh, that's not a pleasant, peaceful environment when you think about it in that regards. Um, FedEx will never threaten your children. UPS will never <laughs> threaten your children. Um, but that's, that's the matrix. That's the language that they hide behind. Um, the pretense that they're here to perform a good. Um, you know, so, so people can redeem themselves. People can uh, get out of there, absolutely. Um, and I find it, to be honest, best to just focus the, the messages and uh, the communications we have with, uh, to begin with, everyone else that's not, uh, that fulfills those vocations. Everyone else that's not a police extortionist or a political ruler. You know, they're the ones who need this information most. That it will take forever. I guess you look at the efficiency and the use of your time. It's like, well, the time I could have had trying to talk to this cop uh, or this political ruler, uh, could have, or a communist, I could have better have spent talking to 10 other people. Um, so while there is opportunity for them to read themselves and get out, um, I don't, we'll, we'll see. Uh, maybe on, on their own, if they come across this information, great, you know, join us. It's awesome. You know, you join, join the champions of uh, real liberty uh, against tyranny. Uh, but for me, I, I like to spend my time uh, efficiently in reaching out to everyone else who's not, uh, who does not fulfill the role of those violent sociopaths. Um, and that's 
pretty much 99% of the population, right? Uh, <laughs> that's everyone else that's not a, a commie, a police extortionist, a political ruler. Uh, I will say also a minarchist, um, you know, so that's what, 98%. <laughs> Um, and that's that's my market target range. You know, when you look at this as marketing wise and trying to um, convey these messages, that's uh, who I, I found to have the best uh, interactions with. Um, we're talking about real freedom. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I was having the conversation uh, with uh, a family member recently about the USPS, and uh, actually, it's not all not everyone kind of understands that as a government agency because I remember. Yeah, yeah, one of my family members was saying, you know, how they just, they just, uh, it's, it's a difficult business or something. <laughs> they, they said that. I'm like, it's not a business. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> They're not making any profit, okay? $16 billion. Like, what's the last, what's the last private business that you know that can be in $16 billion of debt and continue to function <laughs> and not right. make a profit? <laughs> and, uh, and also, I think they also have, don't they have like, um, armed agents? Like, there's armed USPS agents, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure. Um, but, um, but yeah, yeah. U- USPS is like, it's like another, uh, a- a- appeal to antiquity. You know, it's like, it's yeah. like, uh, you know, that and, uh, you know, and education, you know, th- you know, all this stuff that's been going on for so long, people just don't understand that, that it would still exist. And also, you know, roads and <laughs> you know, it would still exist were it not for government, right? It's like government is like this magical entity that, that some people think uh, they attribute things that that individuals could not do, right? Because we have government, this magical entity. But no, you know, individuals make up government. Individuals <laughs> do carry out everything in the name of government. It's just a, it's just a, an idea, right? It's a mentality. It's a very destructive mentality, but it's an, it's just a mentality, right? So, yeah. Put the words government, and all of a sudden has this imposed with this magical property, so they could do no wrong. Um, you know, it's just the only thing that's needed is just a reform every once in a while when it fucks up and it doesn't work. Right? <laughs> or, or, more, or more money, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. More money. Yeah, throw more money at it. That's like uh, Amtrak. Oh, well, I just needed more money. Or like uh, the TSA. Uh, the way that they justify their expenditures increases is uh, by saying, well, the reason why we couldn't stop this or do this is because we didn't have enough money. Uh, so that's you know the function of uh, all these government agencies. Uh, they're not they're not a real business as you're saying. They they cannot allocate resources efficiently. Um, I mean, you have a government monopoly on those prices on the price market. Uh, yeah, you don't know whether you're overproducing or underproducing, and yeah, you can't go about uh, efficiently uh, providing those services. Uh, that's why Russia fell USSR, uh, <laughs> and so. Inevitably, you know, that's where this country is going to, right, with these unfunded liabilities. Um, Detroit is just uh, the first stop. <laughs> uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, train wrecks along the way. Um, and hopefully what we can do, knowing that information, is uh, not so much that you can prevent it. It's too late. It's you can uh, prepare for it and for that transition. Uh, so it, it doesn't wreck everyone as production of Detroit. You found uh, interesting businesses to have arose from it. You have Viper threat management security, uh, and whereas it takes over an hour for police to respond to 911 calls, you have a uh, private security company offering um, a lot of very low, very cheaply costing affordable services for security there. He stopped all the uh, hijacking of trucks, so he's able to you know, lower his prices and provide a lot of awesome services. Um, you have the guy who's, who's uh, replacing mass transit since that shut down, and he has these buses that'll pick you up wherever you are. No centralized political planning routes. Um, you know these buses have Wi-Fi, music, BYOB. Uh, you know it's that's the that's the beauty of what the market could bring, not this monotonous, sterile environment that uh, government brings whenever they try to um, provide or do anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. One interesting thing I uh, yeah. I remember yeah. reading was um, uh, if you. If you- if you remove the government monopoly on on the uh, quote services that it, that it uh, issues, um, it would basically be a business with a crappy product that nobody wants to buy. Right, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> like it just would die immediately when subjected to the natural market forces of you know competition, supply and demand. <laughs> right. It just wouldn't be able to adapt, you know, because that's what happens when businesses cannot efficiently allocate the resources they just either you adapt or you fail right <laughs> and that's not necessarily- which is a good thing yeah. yeah which is a good thing i mean no one's i don't know anyone who shed a tear when blockbuster closed down their last store <laughs> i know right i missed right? the vhs 
<laughs> right. Uh, it's a good thing. You don't want people who don't know how to allocate resources to be in charge of, you know, consumption of resources. Um, you know, so that's, you know, entrepreneurship is not for everyone, right? Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's, that's what you have. I guess during the transition of, uh, of a free society, you know, what do we do with those organizations like the post office? Um, hopefully they will all have uh, sought out real jobs, but, you know, try your luck out in the market. Uh, but, you know, there's going to be a lot of other people competing too, right? So I guess appropriate uh, homestead those resources un own technically they're own own no one owns them so you can have uh, yeah well I guess we'll test their might right if you're saying that the uh, post office could have provided it well here's sir you know test test it out now in a free market environment uh, appropriate that uh, building and see what you can do and meanwhile FedEx UPS DHL and then eventually a thousand of other ones are going to try to provide efficient services uh, to compete and don't cry about it when you no longer, of course, have stolen money to continue sustaining those uh, failed business models. Well, the, that's that's the thing. It's like you can't even. It's again, it's not a business, but they always steal the terms to yeah, make themselves yeah. legit. Like we, we thank you for you know they look at you like a customer or you know, <laughs> uh, like ABC, the monopoly in liquor in Virginia. They 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 look at you and they say, you know we appreciate your uh, your customer loyalty or something. It's like I don't have I can't go anywhere else. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, thank, thanks for choosing the mafia. <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah, there's nowhere else I can go. Nowhere else I can go. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just uh, it's really funny when people uh, don't distinguish between um, <clears throat> you know, like people have the same idea. Like if you're working at a government job or you're working at a you know a private uh, business job, they think they're the same. You know, like, well, it's just the same. You're working at a job and making money, you have a paycheck, right? <laughs> like, they, they don't equate a difference. Like, but no, it's not the same. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, teachers, you know, teachers in public school, maybe they would still have skills that would be useful in, in private settings. But for now, they're paid by extorted funds, right? And that's right. not, I, I don't consider that a job. It's like, it's like, is the IRS agent, is that considered a job? <laughs> like going around and forcing, you know, extorting people? Is that a job, right? right? <laughs> it's, they're, they're role for positions. Yeah. It's funny because a lot of people who are, you know, you find people who are in the libert libertarian party, it's like, you know, we're against welfare. It's like, well, no, be consistent, be universal. That's Those are welfare positions. Working for the government in any capacity are welfare positions. Uh, being a politician, political ruler, those are welfare positions. Ron Paul, when he's sitting on, the, on in his, in his own political throne, that's a welfare position. Uh, it's funny, he has uh, the little sign says, you know, gov don't steal, government hates it, but, you know, <laughs> yourself are taking and receiving uh, that that's the only money uh, for quite a number of years uh, so at least the, and I think the lack of consistency is why it hasn't made much headway towards a free society uh, people are making uh, always trying to find excuses and justifications uh, you know for, for why they continue to accept uh, you know to stay in that status lifestyle um, you know, it's, it's again, anarchy is, is a way of life to continue to continue to reach a state of freedom to find to feel free in which you can sustain yourself, uh, be in an area in which uh, your actions are not harming other people, uh, and that's that's a slow, steady progress. But that's that's something that uh, lasts a lifetime. Uh, but I think that well, I found that uh, those who have tried to advocate free society by being inconsistent is why it's taken forever to get there. Um, Libertarian Party has been around since 1971. It's been around for decades. Uh, no measure of success. Uh, here in Richmond, uh, Virginia's tax form, Virginia, their service, he got 6%. Uh, it's like, all right, you know, at that rate, yeah, we're all will surely die of uh, in tax slavery. <laughs> right. yeah. And then, of course, uh, worse, worse the, uh, the people who've, um, they've reached out into agreeing that, yes, uh, all private property should be respected, right? Um, of course, the party, the political code will say, well, except for this area, except for some of this stuff, uh, some private property should be respected. It's like then you, you're no different than all the other political ideologies and demagogues out there. Um, and I think that's, that's the best way to get out of this whole, best way to break the matrix. Uh, the government uh, thrives on inconsistency and it will continue as long as it can continue to trick you into compromising uh, your own based on inconsistencies. Uh, great, you know, that's just the way of life, inconsistencies, and then people can't break out of that. Um, you know, at least if you're going to say you're against theft, be against all theft. If you're going to be saying that you respect private property, respect all private property. 
uh, not just some areas or when it suits you. Uh, same thing with anarchy, right? If you're going to say that you're that it's you're against political rulers, it's not sometimes with exceptions. It's not sometimes when I feel like I want to be a political ruler, uh, <laughs> right? What kind of message are you conveying then? <laughs> that uh, political rulers are bad and wrong, except if I'm your political ruler. Except for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you're advocating, uh, again, the, the whole, you're advocating slavery. You're advocating uh, that a slave master will set you free. All right? And people looking at that and seeing that, seeing those inconsistencies, will draw upon their own inconsistencies and justifications and excuses for their own lifestyle of statism that they live in as well. You know, fuck it. Uh, role not, is not more and there's no integrity, why should I have it too? Uh, and that's what you know, you'll find when people try to advocate uh, freedom through politics. Um, and that's why politics has never, ever set anyone free. Um, it's a distraction. It uh, delays uh, the opportunities we could have and in investing all that time and energy and money and commitment to achieving real establishments of uh, friendships with our own community. Um, instead of just wasting it all into something that will never bring about freedom, that's never shown no measurable success. Yeah, yeah. The uh, <laughs> the meme with uh, Boromir from Lord of the Rings. You know, he says, yeah. <laughs> he says we're gonna use the state to end the state. Ah, <laughs> very, <Right>. very clever. <laughs> I love that. It's right. Like, it's like uh, you know, I, yeah. I tell people that you know, yeah. When, when people call me a right wing nut or um, you know, uh, you know who are you, who are you listening to? Are you listening to uh, who do they say? I don't know Hannity or one of those people. <laughs> it's like, like no politics is violent. I'm not for violence. All right, <laughs> it's for you know, it's for extorting people. Right, it's theft it's based on uh, based on theft and uh, coercion, and uh, that's not. That's not the um, the principles that are that a, you know civilized society is based on, right? <laughs> people don't like you said. You know, do you use force in your in your everyday life to solve your problems? That's that's just it's a great way to to talk to people. Do you use force? You know, would you use a gun to get what you want in life? You know, and if you don't, then why do you vote for people to do it for you? Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. You, you show them that the the same thing is uh, one and the same. Um, you know, your the participation of that violence, you know, you're passing the gun to the political ruler who passes off to the police extortionists to commit those very acts that you say that you're against, right? And if that's the case, then don't be a coward, uh, you know, hold the gun yourself and tell me if you can still pull that trigger uh, if someone refuses to submit, yeah. right? Uh, and most people say, yeah, they wouldn't. They don't. They don't. Um, I think, again, we've been misled into believing that we're all evil. Uh, government has done a good job with their indoctrination camps into making you believe that. Uh, and of course, they also advocate for violent parenting, right? In that they are, there's corporal punishment uh, found in about 13 tax farms, uh, states, uh, that allow it in their public indoctrination camps. You know, they permit that sort of stuff. They allow parents to hit their children. They, they, they have to. That's how the government does that to uh, the child's parents themselves. Right, so they need a if they want to live in this world, they need to understand who's in charge to obey titles, to obey authority, um, to prepare them for uh, being an adult slave themselves. Um, so yeah, that's uh, uh, again all facets of areas in which you kind of have to if you want to attack the state. It's not just state violence; it's also you know the violence we do to each other, and especially the violence that's most importantly done to children. Um, that's the first government that they face. That's the first state that they uh, encounter um, is their own, uh, I guess, authoritarian figures in their own lives with parents. Is that parent going to be a, a mentor to guide this child? People who own dogs, you know, prize-winning dogs don't even hit their dogs, knowing the negative detrimental effects, you know, to, to breed, to raise a strong breed, you know, it should have the same emphasis on children as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but again, it's uh, information that's, that's still new. And, uh, you know, a lot of this uh, information that we do have uh, is not one in which you can call, I guess, I guess personally quickly judge people for it. Uh, I guess everyone's born at different, come out of the matrix in different points and areas in their lives. It's uh, what they do with that information that is uh, important. Uh, how they receive it, how they, uh, you know, respond to it. Uh, what do they do then after that? 
um, th that then there's areas to redeem themselves. There's areas in which uh, even if your child's already grown, you still have friends who one day will have children and you know help end the cycle there, right? Help uh, the other children have uh, a, a life that maybe uh, you didn't have or maybe your child didn't have it yet, right? There's still time to make these bonds and connections. Um, it's never too late for that. Um, but it's, I guess, those who repeatedly refuse to let go, uh, that eventually you could judge, right? If it takes a year and they still hold on to the idea uh, that, yeah, violence, uh, it's a great way to solve problems. Yeah, you have to, uh, def even after given all the information, the evidence and the facts, uh, you know, they're a rare few, but, uh, yeah, at, at that point, uh, you, you can judge them appropriately, right? Um, so, well, now you're acting in the capacity as a violent sociopath, and maybe that makes sense. Maybe that's what you are, hmm. right? There are some out there, and maybe that's the, the role that you're fulfilling here. Yeah. Well, yes. Well, awesome. I don't want to take up any more of your time, uh, but uh, what, can you let everyone know where they can find your work? Uh, Facebook pages, you, you know, YouTube or, or websites? Yeah. Uh, so you can look at uh, liberatorva.com. Uh, great website there. We're, you can, same thing on uh, Facebook. We have a good uh, community forum group on Facebook as well. A great place about this place, there's there's beaches, there's like uh, Camp 6, there's room for a thousand happy campers there, there's a stage you could play music and do talks, there's also uh, the great selling point is uh, there's also a target range there, so if you've never shot a gun, this is a great opportunity uh, <laughs> to learn how, uh, you know, exercise, uh, practice and sharpen your means of self-defense, right? That starts with you. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely check us out and uh, we look forward to uh, meeting you and I uh, look forward to <laughs> visiting you in New York too sometime soon. Um, thank you so much, Daniello. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, definitely hope to get down to uh, Richmond and meet you guys. Uh, <laughs> my, I do take uh, occasional trips with my wife down there, but uh, still haven't gotten around to me in the, the friendly neighborhood anarchist group. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll make it happen. Absolutely. Uh, so awesome. Thanks a lot for the conversation, Cal. Really appreciate Absolutely. it. You take uh, care, man. Yes. Uh, so this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance dot com and the Seeds of Liberty dot com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take See care. you guys at the party. Bye.